talking about the economic policies of the federal government of Nigeria, I think uh, one has to be cautiously optimistic about some of the things we're, we're hearing from, from the presidency. Uh, basically, after a couple of months that the government was sworn in, one would have expected that the, the ministers would be sworn in as well to kick off uh, the, the programs being uh, promised. Uh, but th that was not the case. Uh, most of the people were left in limbo, and people were beginning to ask the questions, what are we really doing? What is coming up next? And uh, not until recently, it seems the whole Nigeria uh, were waiting for uh, Okonjo Iwela to come and give us a direction. Uh, but then, good enough, uh, I, I think the woman is good, and she has uh, uh, a determined effort to make a change and uh, everyone is looking forward to to see what change that is going to make but now one has to be very uh, cautiously optimistic about some of these policies um, lately most nigerians have uh, given up the facts uh, the hope that uh, things are going to change so it is going to take some time for the federal government to convince the masses that look things are actually going to change if you look at most of the businesses operating in nigeria their biggest challenge is electricity and until when we focus on that and fix it once and for all, even if it's a gradual process, but then we have to fix it and we have to begin to fix this uh, this uh, dangerous, it's a dangerous disease. Let me call it it's a dangerous disease right now. And this disease, uh, epileptic power supply, has crumbled a lot of businesses. And in Nigeria today, there is no business that depends on um, electricity that can survive or that can make good profit. Look at most of our hotels are very expensive. We have... Uh, like somebody was saying that Lagos operates uh, or Nigeria operates the most expensive hotel in the world because uh, most of the hotels you have to depend on electricity 24 hours and then if the electricity is not working, um, the government electricity is not functioning, then you have to get your own electricity and that is buying uh, the generator and, and getting the diesel and the diesel price is something that you cannot predict all these things are things that are making our economy not to progress and then when you begin to hear information, from one from the central bank and the other from the minister of finance and all these informations that are not well coordinated sends wrong signal into the market. And then these are the things that one has to be cautiously optimistic to see or to depend on the policies and to feed the policies of the federal government of Nigeria because all this information is coming out from all corners of the, of, of, of the government. And uh, it's not something that really gives one uh, enough confidence uh, to trust these policies. Some of them may work, uh, some of them may not. Um, but that's why I said uh, one has to be cautiously optimistic about the economic policies. Because most of the rules and regulations that we're hearing, maybe because there's no clarity on some of those rules or some of those ideas, uh, some of the ideas may, may be good. But then, how do you defend this? If a bank would just unilaterally, I mean, tell customers that to open a savings account, you need a minimum of 25000 Or even if you have the savings account, the minimum balance in your account should be 25000 and this is a country whereby 18,000 minimum wage is not being paid, I mean, to, to a large extent in most of the states. And then you are compelling the people uh, to have 25,000 minimum uh, balance on their account. Th this sounds ridiculous because, uh, I mean, that means you don't want the people to bank uh, their money. Uh, at the same time, or maybe you want them to go and keep their money at home. And then it makes most of the Nigerians unbankable. And then what do we do? These are some of the regulations that have to be controlled. And the next day, the central bank comes out and says, no, we are not part of it. Then who rules the system? Who gives the instruction? Who rules the banking industry? This is, just, this is just one of those things that I think is something that has to be controlled. And more so, I have said it, if you feel these bankers are not doing the right thing, what about the supervisors who are under the supervision of the central bank governor? That should be something that he has to do. And that means he has to, I mean, clean up his own acts. He has to clean up some of this department and, and, and get some people out of his way. If the bankers are not actually following the rules and regulation being made by the central bank, governing the banks, then this has to be enforced. And that, was, that is why we have uh, um, supervisors 
in central bank that should be able to supervise all the banks. And if the supervisors are not doing their job accordingly, then they have to be they have to be punished for that. And it is not enough to just come back and give uh, counter brief uh, uh, briefings and uh, to say no. Since central bank is not part of this, these banks are just doing what they like. And another bank will come up and say, look, this is what I want to do. Then there is a lot of chaos in the in the system. And who is to be blamed? Then we have to control this, and we cannot afford this to be something that will just be part and parcel of our society. Another thing is the issue of uh, uh, non-interest banking. This is a fantastic idea, but we have tried to bring it into a mess, and it has come to a messy discussion that whereby uh, we are now saying Islamic banking, or maybe some people say that you call it Christian banking or Christian banking. I mean, the people of the nation, the people of Nigeria, they don't really care what you call it. It's just like a brand name. Go call it any name and let the people enjoy the benefits of banking. I mean, if you, as a Christian, and you have to do your business, and you can go to a place, you can take a loan that is not with interest, fine. Be it a Muslim, call this bank any name, Islamic bank, Christian bank, even if you call it a Shango bank or Goon bank or whatever bank, people will go there and take this money and do their business. The most important thing is to encourage entrepreneurship and at the same time to alleviate hardship. Because if you go to any of these commercial banks today and you say you want to set up a business, most of them you cannot meet the requirements. So if this non-interest banking is come, is a laudable idea. I think you know uh, the governor of Central Bank should push it to the limit so that we can get this thing operating as soon as possible. The masses are very interested in it. And those who are sitting down somewhere trying to agitate for something else, I mean, they have to get their minds cleared and they have to see that they are not really uh, speaking for the masses. I mean, the masses, they want a bank or they want places they can go, take money, and then go back and do their business and bring it back safely. I mean, if this thing can work in other parts of the world, it should be able to work in Nigeria. Nigeria. Imagine now, you see the, the, the microfinance banks. These microfinance, bank, microfinance banks, they cannot really uh, uh, do what they're supposed to do because they are even charging sometimes more than the commercial banks. And people are not going there. People don't trust them like before. So there's a problem. So let us regulate the market. Let us bring what is innovative and control it and manage it to see that the people who will use it, they use it so well, and the success of it, we, we at the end of the day, we justify the, the setting up of these non-interest bank uh, banks that we want to set up in Nigeria. I think that's a good innovation, and it should be supported. But most importantly, I think the governor of Central Bank has to look into his uh, own uh, system and uh, flush out a couple of people that are not that are not w- been there. Because if you look at it, since Soludo left that place, I mean, a lot of things have changed. I've changed in the sense that most of the banks, they have now uh, been shut down or they are now looking for measures or measures and, uh, measures and acquisitions are going on. And uh, some of these people, they don't even know what to do. So now, he, within a short period of time, there was a, a sanitized market, let's put it that way. Um, but we have seen that most of the shareholders' uh, investment has gone down the drain. There's no doubt about that. So what do we do? Then, a few months ago, we just overnight, you just discovered that about four banks or three or four banks just uh, came up with a different name. Nobody knew what was going on. So these names just spring up, no information about it, and begin to say, oh, this is what it is all about. Terrorism is a global challenge, and Nigeria belongs to the global community. And uh, what we need... Uh, to tackle terrorism in Nigeria is uh, a good intelligence gathering. We need to train our people and retrain them again and again to be able to do this job very well. You know, it is not enough just to bring in experts from all over the world to come and assist us. I'm not against that as a person, but I think we need to train our people in the area of intelligence gathering. We have brilliant men and women in uniform that can do this job. But most times, I think we have failed in retraining some of these people and in giving them incentives to perform their duty. Uh, This duty is um, something that is is enormous. And now we're beginning to see the realities. I mean, if we have not learned enough from the attack on the headquarters of the police and now the attack on the United Nations building, then uh, something is wrong. 
we have to learn from this and begin to uh, to be more serious in intelligence gathering. And when I say intelligence gathering, even if we bring the experts from all over the world, they, these experts cannot speak our language. They won't be able to penetrate into a lot of areas. They don't know the terrain. They don't know the culture. They don't know the people very well. So they still depend on our people. And that is why I say that we need to train and retrain our people and we need to give them incentives to be able to do this job. And, you know, if you look at what is happening right now in Nigeria, you will discover that this has taken a new dimension. Most of the guys behind these things are well-educated people. And we have to make sure that we encourage our youths to be more proactive in doing something positive for this nation and not these negative things. I want to believe that these guys behind these, uh, uh, these acts, they don't have anything positive to think about this nation because what they are agitating for is uh, it's nonsense. They don't even have a focus. They don't have policy at all. They don't know what they want. And if these people don't know what they want, they just gather some bunch of uh, illiterates who we just go and act foolishly. Because most of these guys, if you ask them what they've done or what they're going to do, they don't even understand what they're going to do. So all we need is to encourage the intelligence community to do more. And most especially, you have a couple of our retired men and women who are experienced, and with their experience, they can still do a lot more. They can still serve this nation. So we need to bring back some of those experienced, uh, retired uh, people who are really interested in this nation. Let's find them where they are. Let's bring them uh, to, to discuss on how to, uh, to save this nation. Uh, this is not good for now, and it's not going to be, be a good thing for this nation because this is, this is a, a problem that uh, we have to face. And let us face it now and solve this problem once and for all before it degenerates into something that uh, we cannot cope with.